Chapter 6 They spent that night camped within the protective fringes of the black oak in a small clearing. Sheltered by the big trees and dense shrubbery, which blotted out the dreariness of the lowlands of Cleep, less than 50 yards to the west. The heavy mist dissipated within the forest, and it was possible to look skyward to the magnificent canopy of interlocking boughs and leaves several hundred feet above them. Where there had been no sign of life in the deathly lowlands, within the giant oaks, the mingled sounds of insect and animal life whispered through the night. It was pleasant to hear living things again, and the three weary travellers felt at ease for the first time in days. But lingering in the back of their minds was the memory of their prior journey to this deceptively peaceful haven, when they had been lost for several long days and nearly devoured by the ravenous wolves that prowled deep within its confines. Moreover, the tales of unfortunate travellers who had attempted to pass through the same forest were too numerous to be disregarded. However, the young Southlanders felt reasonably secure at the edge of the Black Oaks and gratefully made preparations to start a fire. Wood was plentiful and dry. They stripped to the skin and hung their soggy garments on a line near the small blaze. A meal was quickly prepared, the first hot one in five days, and devoured in minutes. The floor of the forest was soft and smooth. A comfortable bed compared to the dampened earth of the lowlands as they lay quietly on their backs gazing skyward at their gently swaying treetops. The bright light of the fire seemed to shoot upward in faint streaks of orange that gave the impression of an altar burning in some great sanctuary. The light danced and glittered against the rough bark and the soft green moss that clung in dark patches to the massive trees. The forest insects maintained their steady hum and contentment. Occasionally one would fly into the flames of the fire and extinguish its brief life with a dazzling flash. Once or twice they heard the rustle of some small animal outside the light of the fire, watching from the protective blackness. After a while Minion rolled over on his side and looked curiously at Shea. What is the source of the power of those stones, Shear? Can they grant any wish? I'm still not sure. His voice trailed off and he shook his head vaguely. Shear continued to lie motionless on his back, staring up for a few moments as he thought back on the events of that afternoon. He realised that none of them had spoken of the old stones since the mysterious vision of the Black Oaks and that awesome display of incomprehensible power. He glanced over at Flick, who was watching him closely. I, I don't think that I have that much control over them, he announced abruptly. It was almost as they made the decision. He paused, and then added absently, I don't think I can control them. Minion nodded thoughtfully and lay back again. Flick cleared his throat. What's the difference? They got us out of that dismal swamp, didn't they? Minion glanced sharply at Flick and shrugged. It might be helpful to know when we can count on that kind of support. Don't you think? He breathed deeply and clasped his hands behind his head, his keen gaze shifting to the fire at his feet. Flick stirred uneasily across from him, glancing from Minion to his brother and back again. She has said nothing, his gaze focused on some imaginary point overhead. Long moments passed before the Highlander spoke again. Well, now at least we've made it this far, he declared cheerfully. Now, for the next leg of the trip. He sat up and began to sketch a quick map of the area in the dry earth. Sharon Flick sat up with him and watched quietly. Here we are, Minion pointed to a spot on the dirt map representing the fringe of the Black Oaks. At least, that's where I think we are, he added quickly. To the north is the Miss Marsh, and further north of that, the Rainbow Lake, out of which runs the Silver River east to the Anar Forest. Now, best bet is to travel north tomorrow until we reach the edge of the Miss Marsh, then we'll skirt the edge of the swamp. He traced a long line, and come out on the other side of the Black Oaks, 
From there, we can travel due north until we run into the Silver River, and that should get us safely to the Anar. He paused and looked over at the other two. Neither seemed to be happy with the plan. What's the matter? He asked in bewilderment. The plan is designed to get us past the Black Oaks without forcing us to go directly through them, which was the cause of all the trouble the last time we were here. Don't forget those wolves are still in there, somewhere. She nodded slowly and frowned. It's not the general plan, he began hesitantly. But we've heard tales of the Miss Marsh. Minion clapped his hand to his forehead in amazement. Oh no, not the old wives' tale about a Miss Wraith that lurks on the edges of the Miss waiting to devour stray travellers. Don't tell me you believe that. No, oh, that's fine coming from you. Flick blazed up angrily. I suppose you've forgotten who it was that told us how safe the Black Oaks were just before that last trip. All right, soothed the lean hunter. I'm not saying that this is a safe part of the country and that some very strange creatures don't inhabit those woods. But no one has ever seen the so-called creature of the marsh. We have seen the wolves. Which do you choose? I suppose that your plan is the best one, interjected she hastily, but I would prefer it if we could cut as far east as possible while travelling through the forest to avoid as much of the Miss Marsh as possible. Agreed, exclaimed Minion, but it may pre prove to be a bit difficult when we haven't seen the sun in three days and can't be really sure which way is east. Climb a tree! Flick suggested casually. Climber stuttered the other in unabashed amazement. Why, of course. Why don't I think of that? I'll just climb 200 feet of slick, damp, moss-covered tree bark with my bare hands and feet. He shook his head in mock wonderment. Sometimes you appall me. He glanced warily over at Shear for understanding, but the Valman had bounded excitedly to his brother's side. You bought the climbing equipment? He demanded in astonishment when the other nodded. He clapped them heartedly on his broad back. Special boots and gloves and rope, he explained quickly to a bewildered Prince of Lee. Flick is the best climber in the Vale, and if anyone can make it up one of those monsters, he can. Minion shook his head uncomprehendingly. The boots and gloves are coated with a special substance just before use that makes the surface rough enough to grip even damp, mossy bark. He'll be able to climb one of these oaks tomorrow and check the position of the sun. Slick grinned smugly and nodded. Yes, indeed, wonder of wonders. Minion shook his head and looked over at the stocky valman. Even the slow witted are staring, are starting to think. My friends, we may make it yet. When they awoke the following morning, the forest was still dark, with only faint traces of daylight filtering through at the top of the great oaks. A thin mist had drift, drifted in off the lowlands, which, when glimpsed from the edges of the forest, appeared as sunless and dismal as ever. It was cold in the woods, not the damp, penetrating chill of the lowland country, but rather the brisk, crisp, cool of a forest early morn. They ate a quick breakfast and then Flick prepared to climb one of the towering oaks. He pulled on the heavy flexible boots and gloves, which she then coated with a thick pasty substance from a small container. Minion looked on quizzically, but his curiosity changed to astonishment as the stocky Valman grasped the bear of the great tree and with a dexterity that belied both his bulky size and the difficulty of the task, proceeded to climb rapidly toward the summit. His strong limbs carried him upward through the tangle of heavy branches, and the climbing became slower and more difficult. He was briefly lost from sight upon reaching the topmost branches, then reappeared, hastening down the smooth trunk to rejoin his friend. 
Quickly, the climbing gear was packed and the group proceeded in a northeasterly direction. Based on Flick's report of the sun's present position, their chosen route should bring them out at a point along the east edge of the Miss Marsh. Minion believed that the forest track could be completed in one day. It was now early morning and they were determined to be through the black oaks before darkness fell. So they marched steadily at times, rapidly, in single file. The keen-eyed Minion led picking out the best path, relying heavily on his sense of direction in the semi-darkness. Shear followed close behind him, and Flick brought up the rear, glancing occasionally over his shoulder into the still forest. They stopped only three times to rest, and once more for a brief lunch, each time quickly resuming their march. They spoke infrequently, but the talk was light-hearted and cheerful. The day wore quickly away, and soon the first signs of nightfall were visible. Still the forest stretched on before them with no indication of a break in the great trees. Worse than this, a heavy grain mistiness was once again seeping into view and gradually thickening amounts. But this was a new kind of mist. It lacked the inconsistency of the lowland mist. This was an almost smoke-like substance that one could actually feel clinging to the body and clothes, gripping in its own peculiarly distasteful fashion. It felt strangely like the clutching of hundreds of small, clammy, chilled hands seeking to pull the body down, and the three travellers felt an unmistakable revulsion at its insistent touch. Minion indicated that the heavy, fog-like substance was from the Miss Marsh, and they were very close to the end of the forest. Eventually, the mist grew so heavy that it was impossible for the three to see more than a few feet. Minion slowed his pace to a crawl because of the increasingly poor visibility, and they remained close to each other to avoid separation. By this time, the day was so far gone that even without the mist, the forest would have appeared almost black, but with the added dimness caused by the swirling wall of heavy moisture, it was nearly impossible to pick out any sort of path. It was almost as if there were three suspended in a limbo world, where only the solidarity of the invisible ground on which they trod offered any evidence of reality. It finally became so difficult to see that Minion instructed the other two to bind themselves together and to him by a length of rope to prevent separation. This was quickly done, and the slow march resumed. Minion knew that they had to be very near the Miss Marsh, and carefully peered into the greyness ahead in an effort to catch a glimpse of a breakthrough. Even so, when at last he did reach the edge of the marsh and bordering the north fringes of the Black Oaks, he did not realise what had happened until he had already stepped knee-deep in the thick green waters. The chill, death-like clutching of the mud beneath, coupled with the surprise, caused them to slip further down, and only his quick warning saved Sheer and Flick from a similar fate. Responding to his cry, they hauled in on the rope that bound them together and hastily pulled their comrade from the bowl and certain death. The sullen, slime-covered waters of the Great Swamp covered only thinly the bottomless mud beneath, which lacked a rapid suction of quicksand, but accomplished the same result in a slightly longer time span. Anything or anyone caught in its grip was doomed to a slow death by suffocation and in an immeasurable abyss. For untold ages its silent surface had fooled unwary creatures into attempting to cross it, or to skirt or perhaps only to test its mirrorless waters, and the decayed remains of all lay buried together somewhere beneath its placid face. The three travellers stood silently on its banks, looking at it, and experiencing inwardly the horror of its dark secret. Even Minion Lee shouted as he remembered its brief clutching invitation to him to share the fate of so many others. For one spellbound second, the dead paraded as shadows before them and were gone. What happened? exclaimed Shear suddenly, his voice breaking the silence with deafening sharpness. We should have avoided the swamp. Minion looked up and about for a few seconds and shook his head. We've come out too far to the west. 
We'll have to follow the edge of the bog around the east until we can break free from this mist and the black oaks. He paused and considered the time of day. I'm not spending the night in this place, Flick declared vehemently, anticipating the other's query. I'd rather walk all night and most of tomorrow, and probably the next day. Their quick decision was to continue along the edge of the Miss Marsh until they reached open land to the east, and then stop for the night. She was still concerned about being caught in open country by the skull bearers, but his growing dread of the swamp overshadowed even this bear, and his foremost thought was to get far away as possible. The trio tightened the rope about their waists in a single file and began to move along the uneven shoreline of the marsh, their eyes glued to the faint path ahead. Minion guide them cautiously, avoiding the tangle of treacherous roots and weeds that grew in abundance along the swamp's edge, their twisted knotted form seemingly alive in the airy half-light of the rolling grey mist. At times the ground became so soft, dangerously like that of the marsh itself, it had to be skirted. At other times huge trees blocked the path, great trunks leaning heavily toward the dull, loveless, lifeless surface of the swamp's waters, their branches drooping sadly, motionless as they waited for the death that lay only inches below. If the lowlands of Cleet had been the dying land, then this marsh was the death that waited, an infinite, ageless death that gave no sign, no warning, no movement, as a crouch concealed within the very land it had so brutally destroyed. The chilling dampness of the lowlands was here, but coupled with it was the unexplainable feeling that the heavy, stagnant slime of the swamp waters permeated the mist as well, clutching eagerly at the weary travellers. The mist about them swirled softly, but there was no sign of wind, no sound of a breeze rustling the torn swamp grass or drying oaks. All was still, a silence of permanent death. They knew well who was master. They had walked for perhaps an hour when she had first sensed that something was wrong. There was no reason for the feeling that stole over him gradually until every sense was keyed trying to find where the trouble lay. Walking silently between the other two, he listened intently, peering first into the great oaks, then out over the swamp. Finally, he concluded with chilling certainty that they were not alone, that something else was out there in the invisible beyond, lost in the mist to their poor vision, but able to see them. For one brief moment, the young Valman was so terrified by the thought that he was unable to speak or even to gesture. He could only walk ahead, his mind frozen, waiting for the un unspeakable to happen. But then, with a supreme effort, he calmed his scattered thoughts and brought the other two men with an abrupt halt. Minion looked around quizzically and started to speak, but she had silenced him with a finger to his own lips and a gesture toward the swamp. Flick was already looking cautiously in that direction. His own sixth sense warned him of his brother's fear. For long moments they stood motionless at the edge of the marsh, their eyes and ears concentrated on the impenetrable mist, moving sluggishly above the surface of the dead water. The silence was oppressive. I think you were mistaken, Minion whispered finally as he relaxed his vigil. Sometimes when you are this tired, it is easy to imagine things. She shook his head negatively and looked at Flick. I don't know, the other conceded. I thought I sensed something. A mist wraith, chided Minion, Minion grinning. Maybe you're right, she interjected quickly. I am pretty tired and could imagine anything at this point. Let's keep moving and get out of this place. They hastily resumed the dreary track, but for the next few minutes remained alert for anything unusual. When nothing happened, they began to let their thoughts drift to other matters. She had just succeeded in convincing himself that he had mis been mistaken in the victim of, of an overactive imagination, brought about by lack of sleep when Flick cried out. 
Immediately she felt the rope that bound them together jerk sharply and began to drag him in the direction of the deadly swamp. He lost his balance and fell, unable to distinguish anything in the mist. For one fleeting moment he thought he glimpsed his brother's body suspended several feet in the air over the swamp, the rope still tied to his waist. In the next second she felt the chill of the swamp grapple at his legs. They might have all been lost had it not been for the quick reflexes of the Prince of Lee. At the first sharp jerk of the rope he had instinctively grasped at the only thing near enough to keep him on his feet. It was a huge sinking oak. Its trunk embedded so far into the soft ground that its upper branches were within reach. A minion rapidly hooked one arm about the nearest bough and with the other grasped the rope about his waist and tried to pull back. Sheer, now up to his knees in the swamp mud, felt the rope go taunt on Minion's end and tried to brace himself to aid. Flick was crying out sharply in the darkness above the swamp and both Minion and Sheer shouted encouragement. Suddenly the rope between Flick and Sheer was slack and out of the grey mistiness emerged the stout, struggling form of Flick Omsford still suspended above the water's surface, his right waist gripped by what appeared to be a, a sort of greenish, weed-coated tentacle. His right hand held the long silver dagger which gleamed menacingly as it slashed and repeated cuts at the thing which held him. Sheer yanked hard on the rope which bound them, trying to aid his brother in breaking free, and a moment later he succeeded as his tentacle whipped back into the mist, releasing the still struggling Flick, who promptly fell into the marsh below. Sheer had barely pulled his exhausted brother from the clutches of the swamp, freed him from the rope, and helped him to his feet before several more of the greenish arms shot out of the misty darkness. They knocked the shaken flick sprawling, and one closed about the left arm of an astonished shear before he could think to dodge. He felt himself drawn toward the swamp and drew his own dagger to strike fiercely at the slime-covered tentacle. As he fought, he caught sight of something huge out in the marsh, its bulk covered by the night in the swamp. To one side, Flick again became entangled in the grip of two more tentacles. His stocky form was dragged relentlessly toward the water's edge. Valiantly, Sheer broke free from the tentacle that held his arm, slashing through the repulsive limb with one great cut. Struggling to reach his brother, he felt another tentacle grasp his leg, knocking his feet out from under him as he felt his head struck an oak root and he lost consciousness. Again, they were saved by Minion his light body leaping out of the darkness behind the great sword flashing dully in a wide arc as it severed in one powerful swing the tentacle which held the unconscious shear. A second later, the Highlander was at Flick's side, cutting and chopping his way past the arms, which suddenly reached for him out of the darkness, and with a series of quick well-placed blows, freed the other Valman. For a moment, the tentacles disappeared back into the mists of the swamp, and Flick and Minion hastened to pull the unconscious shear back from the unprotected edge of the water. But before any of them could reach the safety of the great oak, the greenish arms again shot out of the darkness. Without hesitation, Minion and Flick placed themselves in front of their motionless friend and struck out at the encircling arms. The fight was silent, save for the laboured breathing of the men as they struck again and again, chopping off bits and pieces and sometimes whole ends of the grasping tentacles. But any damage they caused did not seem to affect the monster in the swamp, which attacked with renewed fury at each stroke. Minion cursed himself for not remembering to drag the great ash bow within reach so that they might have taken a shot at whatever it was that lay beyond the mist. Sheer! He yelled desperately, Sheer, wake up! Oh, for the love of heaven, we're done for! The silent form behind him stirred slightly. Get up, Sheer, pleaded Flick hoarsely. His own arms exhausted from the great strain of fighting off the tentacles. The stones! yelled Minion. Get the elf stones! She struggled to a kneeling position, but he was knocked flat again by the force of the battle in front of him. He heard Minion shouting and dazedly felt for his pack. Realising almost immediately that he had dropped it while helping Flick. He saw it now, several yards to the right, the tentacles waving menacingly over it. 
Minion seemed to realise this at the same moment and charged forward with a wild cry, his long sword cutting a path for the others. Flick was at his side, the small dagger still in his hand. With a final surge of his fading strength, Sheer leaped to his feet and launched himself toward the pack containing the precious elf stones. His slim form slipped between several of the grasping arms and he threw himself on the pack. His hand was inside, groping for the pouch. When the first tentacle reached his unprotected legs, kicking and struggling, he fought to keep his freedom for the few seconds he needed to find the stones. For a moment, he thought he had lost them again. Then his hand closed over the small pouch, and he yanked it from his fallen pack. A sudden blow from the writhing tentacles almost caused him to drop it, and he clutched it tightly to his chest as he loosened the drawstrings with numbing slowness. Flick had been forced back so far that he stumbled against Shear's outstretched body and fell over backward, the tentacles coming down on top of them now. Now only the lean form of Minion stood between them and the giant attacker, both hands gripping tightly the great sword of Lee. Almost without realising it, Shear found the three blue stones in his hand, free from the pouch at last, scrambling backward, struggling to his feet. The young bellman let out a wild cry of triumph, and held forth the faintly glowing elf stones. The power lock within flared up immediately, flooding the darkness with dazzling blue light. Flick and Minion leaped back, shielding their eyes from the glare. The tentacle drew back hesitantly, uncertainly, and as the three men risked a second quick glance, they saw the brilliant light of the elf stones streak outward into the mist above the swamp, cutting through at the vapour with the keenness of a knife. They saw it strike with shattering impact, the huge unspeakable bulk that had attacked them as it was sinking sluggishly beneath the slime-covered water. At that same instant, the glare above the disappearing monster reached the intensity of a small sun, and the water steamed with blue flame. They seared upward into the shrouded sky. One moment the burning glare and the flames were there, and next they were gone. The mist in the night returned, and the three companions were alone, again in the darkness and the blackness of the marshland. They quickly sheathed their swords, picked up the fallen packs, and dropped back among the black oaks. The swamp remained as silent as it had been before the unexpected attack, its dull waters disturbingly placid beneath the grey haze. For several moments, no one spoke as they collapsed silently against the trunks of the great oak and breathed deeply, grateful to be alive. The whole battle had happened quickly, like the passing of a brief, horrible instant in an all-too-real nightmare. Flick was completely drenched by the swamp waters and Shea was soaked from the waist down, both shivered in the chill night air. After only a few seconds of rest, they began moving slowly about in an effort to ward off the numbing cold, realising that they had to get free of the marshland quickly. Minion swung his tired body away from its resting place against the rough bark-covered oak trunk, and in one smooth motion, swung his pack into place over his shoulders. Sheer and Flick were quick to follow, though somewhat less eager. They conferred briefly to decide what direction it would be to best take now. The choice was simple, proceed through the black oaks and risk becoming lost and being set upon by the wandering wolf pack, or follow the edge of the swamp and a chance of a second encounter with a mist wraith. Neither choice held much appeal, but the battle with the creature from the mist marsh was too recent to permit any of them to risk a repeat performance, so the decision was made to stick to the woods and to follow a course parallel to the shoreline of the swamp and hopefully gain the open country beyond with, within a few hours. They now had reached the point where the long hours of travelling with the keen anticipation of danger had chipped and worn away the clear reasoning of the morning. They were tired and frightened by the strange world into which they had journeyed, and the one clear thought left in their numb minds was to break through the stifling forest that they might find a few hours of welcome sleep, with that dominating in their thoughts and overriding the caution they were so desperately needed. They forgot to tie themselves together again. The journey continued as before, with Minion in the lead. 
share a few paces back and flick trailing, all walking silently and steadily, their minds fixed on the reassuring thought that lay ahead. Open grasslands that would take them to the Anar. The mist seemed to have dissipated slightly, and while Minion's form was only a shadow, she could make out well enough to follow. Yet at times, both Sheer and Flick would lose sight of the person immediately in front, who would find their eyes straining wearily to keep to the path Minion was making for them. The minutes passed with agonising slowness, and the sharpness of each man's eyesight began to lessen with the increasing need for sleep. Minutes lengthened into long, endless hours, and still they plodded slowly onward through the misty haze of the great oaks. They found it impossible to tell how far they had travelled or how much time had passed. Soon it failed to matter at all. They became sleepwalkers in a world of half-dreams and rambling thought, with no break in the weary march or the never-ending silent black trunk that came and passed in countless thousands. The only change was a gradual building of the wind from somewhere in the shrouded night, whispering its first faint cry, then growing to a numbing crescendo of sound that gripped the tired minds of the three travellers with spellbinding magic. It called to them, reminding them of the briefness of the days behind and those ahead, warning them that they were mortal creatures of no consequence in that land. Crying, them, crying to them to lie down in the peacefulness of sleep. They heard and fought against the tempting plea with the last of their strength concentrating mindlessly on putting one foot before the other in an endless succession of footsteps. One minute they were all there in a ragged line. The next, she looked ahead and Minion was gone. At first he could not accept the fact his normally keen mind hazy with lack of sleep and he continued to walk slowly ahead, looking vainly for the shadowy form of the tall highlander. Then abruptly he stopped as he realised with stabbing fear that they had somehow become separated. He clutched wildly for Flick and grabbed his brother's loose tunic as the fatigued Valman stumbled into him, dead on his feet. Flick looked unthinkingly at him, not knowing, not even caring why they had stopped. His only hope, that he could collapse at last and sleep. The wind and the darkness of the forest seemed to howl in wild glee, and she had called desperately for the Highland Prince, and heard only the echoes of his own futile cry. He called again and again, his voice rising to a new scream of description and fear, but nothing came back except the sound of his own voice, muffled and distorted by the wild whistling of the wind through the great oaks, whisking and wrapping about the silent trunks and limbs and filtering out among the rustling leaves. Once he thought he heard his own name called, answering eagerly, he dragged himself in exhausted flick through the maze of trees towards the sound of the cry, but there was nothing. Dropping to the forest floor, he called until his voice gave out, but only the wind replied in mocking laughter to tell him that he had lost the Prince of Lee.